Um, so turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And let's stand together as we read the first three verses of this chapter. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the house stops. Father, we thank you for this uh, word. It is sobering, to say the least. I pray that we'll, in fact, have that effect on us, but that it would lead us to do as we've just sung, it would be a motivation to live our life and to see life as you see it, and therefore to see ourselves as you see us, and therefore, therefore to make whatever changes are needed, really, Father, to... Um, to not fear a passage like this, but in fact to revel in the forgiveness that you've provided and in the goodness that comes from knowing you. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunities that you continue to put in front of us. We pray for all the activities that are coming up, the Reach Camp in July, the VBS in June, the Free Day in June, and then as we go into the fall, other things being planned, Lord, we ask that every single one of them will bring glory to you, will lead us closer to you, will help us to know you better. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And if you uh, haven't had a chance yet, please turn to Luke 12. Glad you bring your Bibles every week so that you can follow along. That's our one and only authority for faith and practice, right? The Word of God that leads us to God. So I was thinking about this passage and uh, uh, through verse 12, removing masks is the, is the name of the, of the um, series that we'll be going through relative to these verses. I read a, came across a story about a young mother who was very irate. She <coughs> came outside one day and find out that her daughter and the little boy next door were playing doctor. She was quite upset, so she grabbed the little boy by the arm, took him over to his mother's house, and explained what had been going on. Well, the boy's mother, you know, kind of wrote it off. She said, listen, you know, don't take it so seriously. It's just natural for kids to have this curiosity to try and satisfy their curiosity. And the girl's mother said, curiosity? She said, curiosity, my foot, he took her appendix out. <laughs> well, the moral of the story is, Play acting can be destructive. And that's the moral of the theme or the theme of Luke 12, verses 1 through 12. Play acting is destructive. Now notice in verse 1, Jesus says, in the meantime. In the meantime, what? Well, in the meantime, you'll recall, just previous to this, he's been at lunch with one of the Pharisees who invited him for dinner, for lunch. It didn't take very long for that to fall apart because Jesus failed of the man-made ritual the Pharisees had to wash his hands in this ceremonial fashion. It gave Jesus a chance to, I mean, literally light up his hosts there and the ones who were with him over their hypocritical lifestyles with the desire to get them to repent. But lunch is now over, and so they come out. And it says, in the meantime, when many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. A huge crowd has built up in the meantime outside. They've come for teaching. They've come to hear Jesus. But interestingly enough, Jesus, one of the few times we find this, turns first to his disciples. He says, before we do anything else, I have some things I want to say to you. Well, so what was it so urgent that it couldn't, what was so urgent that it couldn't wait? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was the subject 
that Jesus still had on his mind, having come from this lunch. I think as he looks at his disciples, he realizes, you know what? These are the guys that are going to start the church that's going to come along. These are the men who are going to write the New Testament. These are the people who are going to take the gospel to the four corners of the known world. And the last thing that he could afford to have was to have them infected by the Pharisees' disease of hypocrisy. So he treats the issue of hypocrisy to his followers in two sections in this passage. Verses 1 through 3 are a warning against. Verses 4 through 12 are a way to avoid. Warning against, verses 1 through 3, way to avoid, verses 4 through 12. So this morning we're going to look at the warning against. Someone has wisely said, that for many people, many a person's reputation wouldn't know his or her character if they ran into each other on the street. That's unfortunately too true in many times, right? And what Jesus is going to say here is that just can't be true of my followers. I can't have you being hypocrites. What you do must line up with who you are. In Christ. If you think about it, that's the message of most of the epistles of the New Testament. They spend roughly the first half or two thirds of the epistle telling us who we are in Christ, and then they spend the last part of the epistle usually telling us how that should change our behavior. Live up to who you are. So we're going to look at, first of all, today, then the warning against hypocrisy. Three points the falseness, the folly, and the future of hypocrisy, all aimed at motivating us to evaluate our lives, to check them out, to make sure this is not part of who we are. Now notice he starts out in verse one by saying, beware, look out. This happened to the Pharisees, whom these people revered more than anyone on earth. And Jesus is basically saying to his disciples, if it could happen to them, it could happen to you. So beware, this could happen to you. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, just in case they didn't know what it was. It's hypocrisy. Now the word hypocrisy or the word hypocrite, many of you have probably heard this, but it comes from the idea of the Greek theater, right? Where the actor would come on stage with a huge smiley mask that he would hold in front of him as he did his lines that caused the audience to roar in, ra in laughter at his funny lines, right? And then a few minutes later, he would come back on with a mask that was a frowning mask as he went into the tragic part of the play, whatever it was. So they had these masks. Well, guess what the guy was called who was the actor? A hypocrite. He was a hypocrite because he was wearing a mask. He was a play actor. And you never know what's going on behind the, behind the mask, right? He has his, I would assume acting wasn't quite as hard those days. You know, you could have had the sad mask out front and you could be laughing your head off behind the scenes as long as you could say him properly. But the audience would never know. You were a hypocrite. Jesus is saying, that's what I don't want you to be. You can't be those who are different inside than you are outside. That's the way the Pharisees were. They looked so super spiritual. You know, they would, they, would, they would come out and they would make a big show of giving money in the temple. While at the same time, behind the scenes, they were robbing their parents of money that should have been going to them in order that they could make this big show. They would come on and fast and they made it known that they were fasting two days every week. And just in case people didn't get the picture, they painted their faces white and ashen to make them look, you know, really drawn. And man, I am really fasting. They were people who were, who were loving neither God nor man and yet putting on this great show. Hypocrisy, one way to look at it, is a disconnect. It's a disconnect between the inward reality of a person and their outward show, right? There's a, there's a disconnect between those. That's hypocrisy. Hypocrites are out of touch then with 
reality to a degree. And if you think about it, the ultimate in being out of touch with reality, we have another name for, which is called insanity, right? So if you think there's a lot of people running around that look somewhat insane, you're right. Because hypocrisy is a touch of insanity. But we do it. I think we're fooling somebody. The scribes and Pharisees convinced people they were spiritual when they were actually just spiritually dead. They were like the little girl, you know, who was... Her, her, her older brother was always playing practical jokes on her. Tough home life. I think my sister, who came seventh after six boys, could relate to this, right? <laughs> always the butt of the practical jokes. So the little girl was complaining to her dad one day. She said, Dad, Michael's always picking on me. And, she said, and, and dad said, well, you know what? Why don't you, you know, come up with your own practical joke and get back at him? She said, well, what would I do? He said, well, go tell Michael that there's a big elephant in the backyard and watch him run and come to see it. That's not like a good idea to her. So she takes off running down the hall, Michael, Michael. And she gets halfway down, she stops dead. And she comes back, she grabs dad by the hand, she heads for the window and she says, but dad, I want to see it first. <laughs> Self-deceived. You see, that's what hypocrisy leads to, self Deception, it deceives the deceiver most of all. We all do it. Eleven of the Pharisees spreads deceit everywhere. The Pharisees, Pharisees, if they had just sat down and thought a little bit, how difficult would it have been to go through all those traditions that they kept and, and look and see, you know what, this really isn't according in sync with the Word of God, with the law of God. It wouldn't have been that hard to see that. How hard would it have been to see that they were far more interested in what people thought about them, about what men thought about them, than they were about what God thought about them? It wasn't like this was rocket science that they couldn't figure out. But they had long ago, see, decided that the outward was all that counted. They were self-deceived. They destroyed themselves. Matthew 23, Jesus says to them, Matthew 23, 15, he says that they were not only the children of hell, but they were taking others along with them. Certainly no one would do that on purpose. But they were self-deceived. Jesus is warning his disciples, listen, don't go there. It could happen to you. You're just as subject to the possibility of hypocrisy as the Pharisees are. There's a little hypocrisy in all of us. You know, sometimes we encourage it at church. We kind of look down on people that are, you know, that, that are, in fact, sometimes we build ourselves up by looking down on people that we think are a little less spiritual than we are. You know, those who have doubts or those who have despair or those who are dealing with a difficult circumstance of some kind. And they can, they can be here and they can determine, wow, those people don't love me because I'm not up to par. And so they'll do one of two things. They'll either leave or they'll put on a show. Now listen, we need to be repentant. We need to be trying to change our lives. But beloved, we all suffer from these kinds of things, right? Part of the reason for being here is to help, is to be an instrument of God in each other's lives to heal, bring healing from these very things. Instead, we sometimes encourage people to act spiritual rather than to actually be spiritual. That's why, it's why the, you know, the first of Luther's 95 theses that he posted on that door in Wittenberg that eventually led to the Reformation, you know what the first one said? It said the life of a believer is a life of repentance, not a one-time thing. Yes, one-time thing for salvation. Luther would have been the first to stand up and say that, but he recognized that out of that repentance should come a lifestyle of repentance, a lifestyle of evaluating our life before God a lifestyle of opening ourselves to God's evaluation and to God's looking into our hearts to, to lead us to become in practice who we are in position. In the Old Testament, there's a, there's a great example First in 1 Samuel. Turn, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel 9. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. So it's what, 10, 10 books in or something like that? First Samuel chapter nine. 
the Old Testament, Israel clamored for a king like the other nations. Remember that? And so God gave them one to their own specification. And so he tells us in 1 Samuel 9, verse 2, there was not among, a man, among the people of Israel more handsome than this guy Saul. No more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. He looked a king, every bit of it. He was good looking and he was tall and you could see him and he looked like a leader. Saul looked the part. There's an interesting play on words here that Stephen Dempster points out in his book, Dominion and Dynasty. I'm obliged to Jesse for pointing this book out to me. He says there's a play on Hebrew words with Saul. Saul comes from Gibeah, Gibeah, the city of Gibeah. <clears throat> it, was known as, it was known as kind of the Israeli Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not a, a good place, but the word Gibeah itself meant tall. It meant hill or elevation, Gibeah. The Bible says that, Paul, that Saul was tall, Geboa. Geboa, tall. So here's tall Saul, who comes from tall Gibeah, but guess where he dies? On the mountain of Gilboa, a mountain. Tall Paul died on the mountain of his tallness. Why? Because his tallness was all outward and inside he was small. When God looked, that's all he saw, smallness. He fooled everybody, including Saul fooled himself. God tells Saul, if you turn over to Chapter 13, verse 14, 1 Samuel. Chapter 13, verse 14. Samuel says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. It's the prophet speaking to him. He says, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. See, Saul was all outward. But Saul was after his own heart. David, who followed him, failure and all, was still a man after God's own heart. And a lot of failure in his life, as we know. But in God's mind, he was tall because his heart was after God. And we need to be like David. David describes his heart in, in, in Psalm 51, verse 7, where he talks about a broken and a contrite heart. And he says, that's the kind of spirit, that's the kind of heart that God is looking for when that realizes who we are in reality. So the falseness of hypocrisy, it's never gonna be real, beloved. It's always gonna be living in a fantasy land, land of unreality. Second, how about the folly of hypocrisy? Verse two, back in Luke, back in Luke 12, the folly of hypocrisy. What's the first reaction that you have when you realize you've done something wrong? You know, some wickedness, great or small, has entered your life, you know you've done something wrong. What's the first reaction? Admit it, cover up. Cover up is the first reaction, is it not? It's just, it's inbred in us, it's born into us. It's, it's as natural to us as eating. If I do something wrong, the first thing I wanna do is cover it up, blame somebody else, point somewhere else, Cover it up, pretend it didn't happen, deny it, whatever, cover it up. It's inherited from the Garden of Eden. You know, a quick aside here, think about this. The fact that we want to cover up is one of the signs of the, of the reality of God's existence and the reality of the fact that he created us. Because why do we cover up? Shame. Shame causes us to cover up. Now the question is, where did that come from? Where did any sense of shame come from? It certainly was not something that the animals feel that we would have somehow inherited them from that evolutionary process. In fact, there's nothing in the evolutionary process that says here's where shame came from. There's nowhere. So where did it come from? The Bible knows. The Bible knows where shame comes from. Shame comes from the fact that I have violated the law of God written in my heart, according to Romans 2.15. 
And I can deny that, I can suppress it, I can repress it, I can rationalize it, I can do a lot of things with it. What I can't do is absolutely erase it. I'm going to know that I have violated the character of God. And my first response is going to be, i got to cover it up. Just like Adam and Eve. I must cover this up. But here's where the folly of hypocrisy comes in, beloved, because it won't work. We can't cover our own faults. We can't cover our own sin. We can't cover our own wrong. We have to own them, but we don't go there. There's this flawed assumption that kind of is at the base of this premise that somehow we can cover up our true person. It's a fool's errand. That's why Jesus says to his disciples in verse 2, nothing is covered. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. Nothing is hidden that will not be known. There are no secrets from him. Does he say in 1 Samuel 16, 7, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the what? Heart. One of the key interpretive verses in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, remind us that God will disclose the purposes of the heart. Secrets are just human illusions. They're a form of insanity. God sees it all. It's all coming out. Hebrews 4.13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let that sink in for a minute. The one to whom we give account sees every deed that we do. He sees every thought of our heart. He sees every idle word. That's why he can say honestly, every idle word will come into judgment, right? God doesn't miss anything. It's like this door-to-door salesman, you know, walked up to the door one day. 12-year-old kid opened the door with the biggest cigar the salesman had ever seen. This may have been your kid, don't laugh. So here he comes. He takes, he, the, the, the salesman says, well, son, is your mom home? And he, he takes a big puff off the cigar, blows smoke in the guy's face, and he says, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Mom is missing, right? So the cat will play. Mom's not there, but you know who's there? God's there. God is never missing. And God never misses anything. God is there. There's nothing hidden from him. We think we can hide. It's just an illusion. We get brainwashed, you know, like the hillbilly that went to Vegas and he signed the register, you know, and he couldn't write, so he signed X, signed his X. And then he looked at it for a minute and he looked at it and he picked up the pen and he circled it. And the clerk said, what, what, what are you doing? How come you circled your X? He said, well, you know how it is. Sometimes when you're in a place like Vegas, you don't want to use your real name. <laughs> We've been brainwashed to think, you know, that whatever, whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Guess what? It, God's going to make sure that it shows up in Eaton sooner or later. Absolutely. Going to show up in Eaton sooner or later. And I'll tell you what, if it doesn't show up here, it's going to show up in the judgment, right? It says in 1 Timothy 5, 24, the sins of some people are conspic- conspicuous. Going before them in judgment. So, you know, some of them you just look at and you know right away. But the sins of others appear later, but they do appear. Nothing's hidden. With God, there are no secrets. There are no hiding places. We know that. We know that. But you know, one, one of the big things about hypocrisy is that it has, it has such an ability to cause us to deny what we, what we actually know. That's why Adam and Eve thought they could hide, right? They went and made those fig leaves. What were they doing? They were hiding. But it wasn't long before God showed up and said, "Mm, Adam and Eve, where are you? Cain thought he could get away with murder in the privacy of the field where he took his brother Abel. But the next thing he heard was God saying, 
Mm, Cain, where's your brother, Abel? Sarah thought she could laugh in the privacy of her own tent. When she heard God say, when she's 90 years old, you're gonna have a, Sarah's going to have a baby next year. <laughs> she laughed. Next thing she heard was God saying to her husband, Abraham, why is Sarah laughing? There's nothing hidden. Beloved Achan thought he could get away with helping himself to a little bit of the gold and silver at Ai when the children of Israel were camped against them and going to battle against them. But you remember, the whole nation was defeated. And when Joshua went to God and said, what? We just captured Jericho by walking around the walls, and now we come in conventional warfare, outnumber them three to one, and defeat what? And God said what? Israel has sinned. And then he took him directly to Achan. What's his point? Nothing is hidden from God. David thought he could cover adultery with murder, and God sent Nathan to say, you are the man. It's nothing hidden, beloved. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. There are no hidden things from God. And so as we sit here this morning, beloved, as God scans this audience, what does he see in your heart? Because I can tell you this, he sees every heart that's set on revenge, maybe sitting here right now trying to figure out how to take out your frustration and your bitterness on someone who has done you wrong. God sees it. He knows the secret fantasy life. He knows the habit that not even your spouse knows about. How you're hiding the money, hiding the bills, whatever. He sees the joy you take in another's downfall, even as you're outwardly sympathizing with them. He sees it all. He sees the harsh attitudes that you think are hidden behind the doors of your house that you take out on your family. God sees it. He's not fooled. God sees the burning ambition to advance at any price. He sees the income accepted under the table and not reported for tax purposes. He sees the unfinished mission. There are no secrets from God. God sees it all. So what do we do? There's only one answer, beloved. There's only one way it can be covered, and that's repentance. A serviceman was giving a briefing one day, a young guy, you know, and they had a break. He noticed that there was a gold pencil laying on the floor. He picked it up, and when they reconvened, four generals are sitting on the front row. He takes it to them, and he says, I think one of you gentlemen dropped this pencil. And one of them recognizes it immediately, grabs it and says, oh, thank you. He said, I'm, I'm so happy to get this back. I didn't realize I had, I had lost it. He said, how did, but how did you know it belonged to one of us generals? Because it's made out of gold? He said, no. He said, permission to speak, sir? The general said, sure. He says, because the eraser's never been used. <laughs> eraser's never been used. Let me ask you, is the eraser getting used in your life, beloved? And not just, not just a kind of a, you know, acknowledging to God I did this, but you don't do anything to repair the damage. You don't do anything to make reparation in your own life to make sure this doesn't happen again. Where are you with God? Repentance, true repentance, which is not just acknowledging the sin, but turning away from it. That's what the word means, as you well know, is the only solution. Finally, the future of hypocrisy. The future of hypocrisy is very important. Hypocrisy has a future. Your hypocrisy has a future. My hypocrisy has a future. The things I have done yesterday that I would not want you to know that God knows has a future. So does your hypocrisy have a future? It's in verse 3. He says, Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. We're all aware, right, that darkness gives the illusion of cover, right? Why is mainly sin done in the dark? Because it's covered from a human perspective. But it's all coming out. The private rooms were rooms in the middle of 
houses, certain houses, storehouses. That's what he's talking about there. They were put there to keep them away. They were harder to get into. And God's saying, okay, those places where you go to have secret conversations in the middle of the house with the door shut, I'm hearing every bit of it. And I'll tell you what else, not only am I hearing it, it's going to be shouted from the housetops one of these days. That's the same thing as saying it's going to be on every channel. This is in the days before TV and radio, right? But what he's saying is everybody's going to know. It's going to be broadcast far and wide. Shouted from the housetops. My, what a thing to think about. Does that cause you to think twice? It's intended to. I was in the sixth grade when someone first quoted that to me. I'm going to tell you my easy sins, not my tough ones, right? But I was in the sixth grade when I got caught. I got caught passing notes to this little blonde girl in our class. We liked each other, but we were too shy to even talk to each other. I bet we didn't say a dozen words all year long. But we wanted to say, I I like you. So we passed these notes, but somehow we got caught, and I was called into the principal's office to give account for my secrecy. These were notes that these days nobody would even think twice about, but in those days of accountability, it was a big deal because of the secrecy, not because of the content. But somebody in the middle of this quoted to me, it's going to be anything you do in private is going to be shouted from the housetop, scared the living daylights out of me. Hadn't really recognized that before. You know, well, it should because, beloved, it reminds us there are no secrets, not from God, and in the end, not from every, anybody. All will be revealed. God says in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 14, he says, for God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Revelation 12, 20, verse 12 says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they have done. You know, that would be a fearsome thought, even if it was just our outward deeds. But when you think about the fact that God's got your thoughts recorded, whoa. Whoa. It's no wonder Jesus said, you know, if, you, if you're thinking it in your heart, it's the same as if you did it. When we're standing before God, we will be on our face begging for mercy. But at this judgment, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, be too late. Be too late. But mercy is available, beloved. Mercy is available. Mercy is available. Where does it come from? It comes from the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the instinct to cover sin is the right instinct. That instinct came to us from God. What the problem is, is that we implement the wrong solution to the covering. There's only one thing that can cover it, and that's the blood of Christ. Hypocrisy just denies accountability. It doesn't cover That's why Adam and Eve's fig leaves weren't sufficient. That's why God had to come along and give them coverings made from animals, which means there was a blood sacrifice that happened in the background there. What's he teaching? This is the first instance in the Bible of teaching that sin means sacrifice, and it's a blood sacrifice. It has to be covered by the blood. He gave further word pictures. You recall when, it, when later on during the time of Moses, we had the sacrificial system. And once a year, the priest went in to make, to make atonement for the sins of all the people, of, for the nation as a whole. And individual people made sin offerings as they went along. But for the nation as a whole, once a year, be, because this was a great picture. And the priest would go in, you'll recall, and he took the blood of a goat. And what did he do with it? When he got inside the Holy of Holies, where he could only go once a year, What he was met with there was the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? And inside the Ark of the Covenant, buried deep inside were the Ten Commandments on the tablets where God had written in his hand the Ten Commandments. And above that was the mercy seat. And above that in the early days was the the presence of God illustrated in a cloud that was there, the Shekinah glory of the Old Testament. 
So here's God, here's the Ten Commandments which are condemning man, and there's a mercy seat, but they're not forgiven until what? Until the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat. It takes the blood to come between God's wrath against sin and the, and the, and, and the law which has condemned these people. It's the only thing that can cover. That's what he's teaching us. Mercy comes only because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats, by the way, can't really take away sin. It was just a picture. It was just a symbol. So what it couldn't do, God has done in the person of his son, sending Jesus to give his blood, to give his life for us. So that now he can promise to those who believe in 1 John 1, 9, if you will confess your sin, he will forgive and cleanses us from all sin. It's the blood of Jesus that does that. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us continually from all sin, present tense. Hebrews 9, 22 tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. It goes on four verses later in verse 26 and says, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You honestly think God came and sacrificed his own life and gave his own blood and there was some other way that your sin can be covered? Think about that. This is the only way. The salvation comes when we repent once for all of our sin. And we are covered by the blood of Christ and judicially we stand before him from that point forward, perfect. But what's interesting to me in this passage in Luke is God's, Jesus isn't talking there to all of the whole crowd, mix of believers and unbelievers, mostly unbelievers, not talking to them. Who's he talking to? Makes a, Luke makes a specific point about it. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his disciples. Now they as believers were covered. Their sin had been covered by the blood that would be shed by Christ coming up in just a few weeks. Their sins were covered. So why is he coming to them? They're never going to come into this judgment. He's already told them in John 5.24 that if they will put their faith and trust in him, they, they have eternal life now and they will not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. If that's all true of them, why? Is he talking about hypocrisy? And, how to, and why is there a need to cover hypocrisy? Because this, beloved, because while they will never come to the great white throne judgment, while they will never come to the judgment to determine are they in heaven or out, they, that, fate, that fate has already been determined. They will come into a judgment that determines their reward or lack thereof. Every believer. So even though you're failures and your hypocrisies and your sins and your wickedness and your thoughts that go the wrong places will not be judged to determine whether you're in heaven or not. They will be judged to determine reward. Turn to 1 Corinthians 3. While you're there, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 5 for just a moment. Two main passages in the Bible on this. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. I'll read that. You go to 1 Corinthians 3 and I'll be there in a minute. Well, listen to this in 2 Corinthians 5, general statement of the, of the judgment of believers. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, Paul says, for we must all appear, and he's speaking to believers now, the saints that are in Corinth. He's called them saints at the beginning of that passage. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Sometimes you'll hear, hear this referred to as the Bema seat because that's the name that's on it. If you went to Corinth today, you would see a judgment place in ancient Corinth that has the name in, written in Greek, Bema or Bema written on it. It's actually a place where Paul actually stood at one time when he was on trial in Corinth. He says, we're all gonna stand before the judgment seat, not in Corinth, but the judgment seat of Christ. All of us, believers, we're all going to stand there. Why? 
so that each may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So please note, both good and evil, deeds, words, thoughts, they're all coming out. Nothing will be hidden. All the secret places will be unveiled. You say, oh, I thought my sins were as far as the east is from the west. They are. In terms of your being judged for the purpose of condemnation. They are. For the purpose of being judged for whether you're in heaven or not. They are as far as God is judge is concerned. But this is God as father. This is God as rewarder. And there... It's all going to come out at this beam of seat judgment before Christ that will determine eternal reward. Now you're in 1 Corinthians 3, so let's pick up in verse 11. 1 Corinthians 3, 11, where we have a little better description of this. Paul says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, if you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, you're going to be in heaven. This is not for anybody that doesn't have that. If you're missing that, you have nothing. But if you have the foundation, which is Jesus Christ, here is your future. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, so that's good works, works of faith, deeds that are on Christ's agenda versus the last three works that are on your agenda, works that are selfish, works that are intended to benefit you, works that make you feel good, Verse 13, each one's work will become manifest. <laughs> Shout it from the housetops. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but, through, but only as through Fire. Let me tell you, you may be able to sit here today and say, you know what, just so I'm in, who cares? You may say that today. You won't say it then. You'll be wishing. And I don't know what the difference is between the rewards. I don't know that. The Bible really isn't very, I could give you some idea, but it's not real explicit on that. But I know this, as those things come out, we're all going to wish, man, that we had spent a lot of time, a lot more time, examining ourselves and finding out how to do the works of the flesh rather than the works of the works of the spirit rather than the works of the flesh, right? We will. Hypocrisy will be weeded out on that day and the loss will be severely felt. Better to weed it out now, right? Better to weed it out now. I'm afraid we're all going to have a lot to answer for one day. We will deeply regret that we have rationalized away the possibility of eternal privilege. We do that by play-acting our way through life. There's the famous story of uh, Steve Jobs, you know, the founder of Apple Computer. He was recruiting John Scully one time from Pepsi. To, they needed a president. He was trying to recruit him, and they went through weeks of talk on and off. Finally, there one day they're in New York City, out in Central Park, and uh, Scull, uh, uh, Jobs finally looks at Scully and says, listen, John, you know, let's cut to the chase here. Need a decision. He says, what do you want to do? Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want to come with us and change the world? What do you want? I ask you, Beloved, if you made no changes in your life now, what would it be like a thousand years from now? How would you feel about what you have presented at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ? Are you just going through the motions of being a Christian? Is it a waste or are you investing your life in the kingdom of God? Don't we want to do that? That's, that's why we're here. He says we're here in church to to essentially motivate each other to love and good works. That's what his word is trying to do for us here. You know, we don't want to be like the pilot who came on and said, I got good news and bad news. The bad news is we're off course. The good news is we have a great tailwind. So you're, so you're in a hurry going nowhere, right? Some of us, that's the way our Christian life is. It need not be that way. Let me, let me tell you, it's not, even, it's not just great then, there's nothing greater than living a Christian life now. 
You, you'll never be happier. To the extent that we're not, we're insane. No wonder we're unhappy. No wonder people come for counseling because they won't obey what the Lord is saying. They're detached from reality to a certain extent. Don't be hypocrites. Jesus is saying, avoid it. Avoid it like the plague. Be real. Be real with yourself. Be real with others. Most of all, be real with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the challenge. I hate to think, Father, already of the things that, are, that I have piled up that'll be unveiled on that day. I'd, I'd really like to avoid as many others as I could. Not, not out of fear, Lord, that we will somehow be dumped by you. If we're truly have been called by you and our salvation is secured in you, that couldn't happen. I have no doubt that we're going to have some great regret that goes on at that famous seat judgment. He said that we will suffer loss. I don't think we'll suffer that without some pain. So Father, motivate us. Teach us. Help us to be like you. I want to be like you, Father. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me, will you please, as we close our service. We're going to sing the doxology today. Wonderful reminder of what we have in Christ. That's where we want to end up. but you can certainly be here. We want to share with uh, all of you a great privilege that God is putting in front of us and uh, uh, let you in on some of the things that uh, some of you are well aware of. There's been no secrecy here, but uh, you can get more detail out of the meeting that follows. And uh, so please do that. Elders in, in my office in a few minutes here. Thank you all for being here. Let's pray. Father, pray your blessing on this congregation. Thank you for the places where you continue to call people out here and there for ministries that we would have never thought of, never dreamed, but here they are. And Lord, help us now to faithfully support, to faithfully help, to be there when, when we're needed. Thank you for free day, Lord, and opportunity. I, I just pray that every person in our congregation will be involved in some way. Think of Reach Camp. I pray that there will be none of us that will fail to be praying for those who are going and for the young people who will be there, that you will get a hold of their hearts, not just their behavior, but their hearts. What, a, what, a, what an impact we can have, if nothing else, by praying and supporting. And so, Lord, you have blessed us richly. Help us to bless you richly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.